this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are previewing Week 13 in the NFL with Fabian Sommer of FootballHandicapping.com, getting his thoughts on this week's games and also his his uh, his process for betting in the NFL, finding closing line value, and getting the best number every week. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com. Ed, interesting week in the NFL last week, not just the the Ravens and the Steelers game that finally was played yesterday, but also the Broncos playing a practice squad wide receiver at quarterback. It was a weird week, and I feel like that was definitely the strangest point we've had so far in this weird COVID adventure land that has been the 2020 NFL season. Yeah, that was a heck of a game, right? I mean, you would think that the NFL would consider postponing, moving, that, but I don't know, maybe they're trying to send a lesson about wear a mask inside or whatever right. whatever rule that the, the quarterbacks didn't break, uh, that that they end up they did end up breaking. But here in the in the greater Detroit area, like we couldn't get that game unless you had like red zone. Yeah. So I was telling my kids about it and they're like, Well, we wanna we wanna watch the not quarterback <laughs> play quarterback. It's like, well, you can't, uh, you know, it's there are not Tim Tebow highlights on YouTube, man. Like yeah. you, you can find this. <laughs> yeah. And I was definitely following along. I was like, yeah, he hasn't completed a pass yet. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting, right? Because I mean, when, when Denver had a quarterback, I think New Orleans was a three, four, four ish point favorite in that mm-hmm. game. And then when this all happened, you know, New Orleans goes up to a 17 point favorite and they cover. And one element that I use in my models is market data, right? So I, I take all those closing spreads and, and I adjust for who you played and I, and I get a prediction based on um, what the market thinks, right? And it's a pretty, it, it's a very strong predictor. It kind of varies across sport, but it, it's definitely something I use in my NFL model. And with this game, it's such an unprecedented situation that I can't right. use that game, right? Do I you mean, just you just have it to completely it or how do you do it? What? Do you omit it completely, or do you use the number before the quarterback news happened? No, I just omitted it completely, because who knows where that number is going to close at, right, Right. beforehand. So, you know, you have, like, this midweek number. And then that's also complicating, too, because, like, I'm trying to get market data for New Orleans with Taysom Hill as well, right? Right. And, like... Oh, yeah, so so you have one game of real data here so far. And that was before you even played a game, yeah. Right, exactly. So you you have one game of data on uh Taysom Hill which you, you know I don't really trust yeah. like I, I don't really, I'm, I'm not gonna say I mean I'm starting to trust the market stuff when you get two three games definitely with three plus minus with with two games but you know there's a whole I mean there's if members on my site you know you go through the NFL predictions this week it's like well I can't really give you a number based on one market game but right. if I did this is what the result would be yeah so yeah, 2020 is definitely messing with everything and uh, you know, just try to do the best you can. I also think that Broncos story is super interesting because apparently it initially wasn't going to be a thing, but someone snitched. Um, like someone saw the quarterbacks in their field house. I think it was Lindsey Jones at The Athletic who reported this. Like someone at the Broncos facility called the NFL after they had done their contact tracing interviews and said, hey, check the tapes. They were in this field house with no masks on eating lunch. And that's the reason they all had to sit out, which honestly, like, good for them. I, I don't, I would assume it wasn't right. the Broncos employee, but like, if you're sitting in a room with people with no masks and one of them you've later find out has COVID for two hours, like, they probably shouldn't be on an NFL field. So good for them. But that's also fascinating that it was because someone stitched on them to the NFL. Right. Like, again, that's what they should have done, but it's still fascinating that that's the route to which it happened. Yeah, no, for sure. And like, you know, I, I wonder, I mean, you know, the other thing you could potentially do is just have one of your quarterbacks be on Zoom all the time, right? Your well, that's what they said they're going to do now is they're going to have Blake Bortles, like effectively, like be a drifter. Um, I think <laughs> there was some other, which honestly, it's been the case for a while for Blake, but um, <laughs> there was some other team that said they were going to keep their third stringer kind of isolated. I know that Josh, Mc, I think that Josh McCown's on a team. I don't know which team it is, but I'm pretty sure he's on a team and he's like at home. He's just yeah. been at home all year. Um, but I think there was another team that said they were going to do the same thing. I don't yeah. recall which team it was, but like 
there have been reports this week about who the emergency quarterbacks would be on certain teams. And personally, I want to see a lot of them. Like, I, I don't like, I don't want people to get COVID. I'd like it to be like some other thing. Like they get lost in traffic. I like, can't get, make it to the stadium. So instead the 49ers have to start Jarek McKinnon. Like that'd be great. I'd love that. That would be cool. Kendall Hinton, not quite as cool, but like good right. for him, you know, you know, tough good for, no, exactly. Like yeah. good for him. He got some press. Uh, you know, did the best he could under got the a circle. game check, got a game ball out of it. You know, that's yeah. not bad. And like, hopefully he'll see the field as a wide receiver. One of these days, honestly, the Broncos should give him a, a, an active roster salary the rest of the year out of like recompense for putting him in that situation. Like they should keep him on the active roster, give him that extra salary for that reason. Cause he deserves it. Uh, because, that's a tough situation to be in. So kudos to him. I would love to see Jarek McKinnon, LaVisca Chenault play quarterback at some point in the, in the future, but hopefully under different circumstances. Again, my, my personal preference is stuck in traffic, but we shall see uh, as things go along. Our guest today is, is Fabian Sommer. You can find him on Twitter at S-U-U-M-A-810. He is at football-handicapping.com. We're going to preview week 13 of the NFL. You can also find Fabian on Matchbook. Uh, they do videos up on Twitter. I know Drew Dinzik is in those videos as well, so... Definitely good cast of characters uh, for them with Fabian. We're going to talk about Week 13 in the NFL. I'll also talk about the way he makes his own market numbers and decides where to try to find some closing line value. Yesterday here on Covering the Spread, we talked with Pamela Maldonado about Week 14 in college football. We did go through the Liberty Coastal Carolina game. Obviously, that game is no longer happening. Uh, they'll be placing, or Coastal is facing BYU instead, which honestly, we would have talked about too because that's not like a really fun game. Uh, but yeah. outside of that, we did get some talk about the Sun Belt in either way and also other games Pamela likes for Week 14. To get Pamela's thoughts on that and more, make sure you check out Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Uh, Ed, and just bad timing, I think, on the <laughs> the whole Liberty mess uh, with regards to the COVID stuff yesterday. Well, yeah. I mean, we talked about the line movement and how uh, Coastal, Coastal Carolina had become an 11-point favorite. And then Pam actually messaged me, like, right after we got off that yeah. the Liberty quarterback had COVID. And that's yeah. the line movement. And then things evolved to the game's canceled. And then all of a sudden, hey, look, BYU shows up in town. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, that's going to be super interesting. That's going to be a fun game. I mean, BYU's probably got to be ecstatic. I know, like, again, you don't want people to get COVID, but, like, well, from a circumstance perspective, it worked out well for BYU. Right. Plus, they're going to play a 9-0 and team that my numbers have them as a double-digit favorite as even okay. on the road. So you're going to get a good win. Maybe maybe you'll crack the top 10, and, and we can have, like, you know, yeah. maybe some conversation about how you're not going to get into the playoff. <laughs> And Let's more data case. on Zach Wilson, which I will certainly take uh, for when we come to evaluation time for the spring. Before we get into Fabian for this week, though, we do have to go back to last week. We had James Holtower on to preview week 12 in the NFL and a couple interesting bets there from that one. Covering the past. So last week, again, we had James Holtzauer. Again, Jeopardy! James Holtzauer to preview Week 12 in the NFL. Mostly talked to him about his NFL models, uh, the relationship between betting and Jeopardy. And honestly, like, even if the picks are outdated, the recommendations are outdated, I recommend going back to that one. Hearing what he says, it was a really fun conversation. You can also find James on Twitter, at James underscore Holtzauer. Didn't focus a ton on the actual games. Uh, the one game where he said that his line differed the most in the market was on the Panthers plus three and a half against the Vikings. It did close at Carolina plus three, and they actually almost won that game outright and probably should have, if not for uh, some, you know, wonky things at the end there, a Chad BB touchdown catch and a terrible field goal kick by Joey Sly. They might have won. They did still cover, so James is right regardless, but almost got the win there as well. I had the Dolphins... Minus six and a half against the Jets. That was recorded before the news that Ryan Fitzpatrick would start, and the line eventually moved to seven and a half. So six and a half when we discussed, seven and a half at close, but this one didn't really even require a sweat because the Jets scored just three points, which brutal. 
Uh, just a brutal team across the board. So the Dolphins covered pretty easily there. They won 20-3. to So uh, back-to-back good weeks with riding that Dolphins defense and uh, feeling pretty good about them. Again, a little lucky with the Broncos under 20 points or under 21 points, but, you know, we'll take it for sure. We're going to get into Week 13 here in just one second. But first, hey, Colorado listeners, FanDuel Sportsbook is giving you an opportunity to get the best odds on the market for this weekend's Colorado Buffaloes and Arizona Wildcats game with the three best words in sports betting spread the love it is simple Colorado opened up as a three and a half point favorite in that game but the line will move one point for every 500 customers who wager on it and the best part is no matter when you place your bet you will be locked in for the final spread the game is approaching quickly so download the FanDuel Sportsbook mobile app and place your bets today must be 21 plus and present in Colorado must wager in designated boost market uh, crowdfunding market, I should say. Max wager $50, payout at minus 110. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. They did a, a spread the love thing with like a Lakers game at one point this year, and I think it closed at like Lakers minus 70 or something absurd like that. <laughs> so That's pretty fun. fun promotion. And again, the key in there is it doesn't matter when you bet it, you will get the final number. So right. you don't need to delay. You don't need to wait until you get the best number. But fun promotion, uh, sportsbook.fanduel.com for more information there. Let's bring on Fabian Sommer now to preview week 13. You can find him on Twitter at S-U-U-M-A-810 and find his work footballhandicapping.com and also on Matchbook. We're going to preview week 13 and get Fabian's thoughts on the NFL. Covering the present. Let's welcome Fabian Sommer into covering the spread to break down week 13 across the NFL. Fabian, I know it's late for you over in Germany, so I appreciate the time. How are you doing today? Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Everything all right over here. I hope you are fine as well on the other side of the planet, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as, as fine as fine can be in these weird times. I think that's all we can ask for here. So uh, no complaints yeah. here by any means. And I think that as long as we got that, we're all good. But uh, what have things been like, I guess, for you? Because we know the American side of things when it comes to uh, COVID-19 reactions and things have obviously been underwhelming. But how have things been? Has it been pretty hectic for you the past couple of months as well? um personally not really um i think we are fine over here i think uh, the german government has done a terrific job uh, in terms of um, doing the right measures to contain the spread i think we can always argue about uh, specific measures uh, which don't make sense all the time but i think overall we have done a terrific job and we have one of the lowest death rates um, in the world so i think i can't really complain about yeah. what we have done over the past couple of months. Well, that's no, that's, that's amazing, Fabian. And, and uh, I've, I've been over here at the U.S. Uh, definitely looking up to what the German government has is doing over there. Uh, I also look up to the Germans in terms of uh, playing soccer. Big Bundesliga fan. How did you ever get into the NFL with, with all the, the soccer influence over there? Uh, yeah, so I've been a big soccer fan my whole life. Um, I think I started watching soccer when I, I when I was five years old. Um, I'm a big Schalke fan. I had season tickets. I have a club membership. But over the years, to be honest, uh, the more I've watched football, American football, the more I've lost my interest in soccer. Um, and I think since 2017, 2016, I, I barely watched soccer at all. I try to watch every Schalke game when possible, but um, I've lost my interest completely. Um, it's, it's, it's been getting kind of boring, to be honest. And American football is such a nice and complex sport. So yeah. um, my interest completely shifted in that area. Is it the complexity that draws you towards American football, like the strategy, or what kind of pushed you towards that over watching more soccer? Uh, yeah, uh, so, so first of all, it's it's a complex game, and uh, people in Europe and in Germany who watch football for the first time, they always complain about all the breaks, and um, <laughs> they aren't even playing. It's not fluent, but to, to be honest, to me, that's the fascinating thing about uh, football, that every snap and every play um, starts at zero, and there's so much tactics and so much strategy involved. Um, it's it's just a really, really cool game, to be honest. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Well, this is good. I, this is good confirmation bias for me as a football fan. So I like this. Thank <laughs> you, Fabian. I appreciate that. Now, um, from a betting perspective, you tend to put a heavy emphasis within your recommendations on finding closing line value. And we obviously all want closing line value. It's great to be able to get a better number that you can find later on. But you also have to be able to predict which way the markets are going to move in order to do so. So what are some keys you're looking for when trying to identify in which direction the markets are going to move? So I think overall there are certain ways that lead to Rome. Um, but to me, the, the most important thing is I have to create good numbers. Um, I originate all my NFL numbers, um, usually Monday morning. Um, I use a statistical model. I use a subjective power rating that gives me some kind of a base number for every game. And then I adjust that number with a heavy subjective layer um, of matchup analysis, um, injury situations, etc. And then I come up with a number for every game where I think that the fair market price should be. Um, and then I compare my own numbers to the market. I try to find discrepancies between my numbers and the market numbers. Um, and then it's basically just um, either I'm going to bet something early in the week or there's something that I haven't accounted for um, or let's say some specific injury situations where I want to wait until later in the week. Um, and then it's really just a process of figuring out when to bet a certain game. Um, sometimes it's just easy. Monday evening, I've got my number. I've got, um, let's say, um, three and a half on one game. The number is two and a half. I, I don't have to account for any specific injury situations later in the week. Um, I haven't heard of any um, major moving groups that want to play the other side. So I, I can just fire away. Um, and um, sometimes it's uh, just about information injuries later in the week, more research, more matchup, matchup analysis. So um, sometimes I could adjust my numbers uh, throughout the week and say, oh, here's something that I've missed, um, some specific stuff. And yeah, and in the end, um, the primary goal is that the difference between my number and the number I bet into is higher than the discrepancy between my number and the actual closing line on Sunday um, yep. morning. And when my numbers are good, um, then I will generate a closing line value automatically. Sometimes um, the market is against me and um, I get kicked, so to speak. <laughs> um, um, yeah, but um, over the long term, um, it's looking pretty solid. So, Fabian, when you're doing your analysis, uh, so obviously you start with the model and then you kind of make your subjective adjustments on top of that. Do you try to do that without looking at what the market says to, to not get any bias? Does... Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, usually when you watch uh, the games on Sunday evening and Sunday night and um, sometimes you just scroll down Twitter and there comes bet online and here are our opening numbers, um, I actually try to look away. Um, <laughs> I don't want to see any numbers until uh, Monday morning when I created my own numbers just to um, avoid any possible bias biases. So how much subjective tinkering is there for you on a weekly basis? Are you altering every team or is it just teams that have major injuries? Like how much of this is manual on your part to make the, the, the ratings where you want them to be? So my subjective power rating is all uh, subjective work. Um, and obviously, there are not a lot of um, crazy adjustments you do on a weekly basis. Um, sometimes a big time cornerback gets injured or in an important left tackle um, that could move um, a rating for me quite a bit. Um, but also coaching, for instance, um, the Chargers are a very good example, I think. Um, <laughs> I think just when you look at the Chargers, um, offense and defense, Justin Herbert, they are a pretty good football team overall, but I make a crazy adjustment for the coaching <laughs> aspect. Um, and I can't tell you right now exactly what the difference is, but I, th I think um, I'm like one and a half points lower just because Anthony Lynn is still the head coach of the Chargers. <laughs> Yeah, I still think they're one and six or one and seven in uh, one score games with with Justin Herbert. So uh, probably a good adjustment there. 
Um, also, I wanted to ask you about scheme. Uh, is that something that you use when you're when you're making these subjective adjustments? And, and can you give us an example? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, it's not just scheme, but it's also play calling and trying to understand what the coaches are trying to do on a weekly basis um, on the field. Um, for instance, Frank Reich is a coach that usually tries to attack opposing weaknesses. Um, so um, it was, I, I think, very prominent in the 2018 season uh, when they played the Texans t twice uh, or, or even a third time in the playoffs. The Texans that year had a very good run defense. And even though the Colts were very good at running the ball, I think they had like top eight efficiency metrics on the season. Um, the Texans had a very weak pass defense. And what Frank Reich was trying to do he came out and they had like an 80% passing rate on early downs. They didn't even try to run on a very stout Texas front seven with Debian Clowney, with JJ Watt. Um, and I think that this is very important to know um, because there are also teams like the Lions uh, recently with Matt Patricia and Daryl Bavel. Um, they just try to run the ball with, with Adrian Peterson <laughs> against deck boxes, no matter what the opposing defense is offering them. <laughs> So I think this is one part. And um, the other part is um, scheming. Um, I want to know how a team tries to attack um, defenses um, because that also matters when it comes to injuries. So um, there are teams where the number one wide receiver doesn't matter as much as for other teams. For example, the Lions again. Um, I think this year they had um, on offense an average of 0.3 EPA per drop pick when Kenny Golday is in the starting formation. And when he's out of the game, they average like minus 0.08. Um, mm. And that's because um, Daryl Bevel tries to attack opposing defenses um, with deep drop backs of play action. He wants um, to give Kenny Golday these kind of 50-50 balls. He wants uh, Stafford to be aggressive down the field. Um, and when Kenny Golday is not in the lineup, that scheme doesn't really work. So Marvin Jones is, I think, 31 years old. He's not the guy who's consistently winning these battles down the sideline against um, opposing uh, cornerback ones. Um, and Kenny Golday is that guy. I think it was the Falcons game three or four, five weeks ago uh, where he just had a complete highlight reel of catching 50-50 balls, uh, making great plays at the catch point. Um, and that's pretty much Stafford's game um, the last two seasons and when Kenny Golday is out that's a crazy uh, downgrade for this Lions offense um, and so this is very important for me to understand which players have a high impact within the scheme of the offense and we've seen that a couple of times this year it's not just Galladay you know Julio Jones has definitely had an impact on yeah. Atlanta uh, there are definitely several different examples you could turn to so I think that's a, a sharp way to view things and speaking of scheme let's talk about two teams that are pretty drastic in the way they they operate from a play calling perspective in the Browns and the Titans Titans six point favorites here total is 53 and a half and this game opened at four and a half but it shifted to Tennessee minus six did your numbers agree with that movement towards the Titans, or what do you think led to the interest in Tennessee here? Um, I think I make that game four and a half, um, and I think the, the interest for the Titans is entirely based on the matchup against this uh, current state of the Browns team, so to speak. Um, their, their defense is getting Miles Garrett back, which is a significant boost for the defensive line, especially when you play against a left tackle David Cressenberry of the Titans. This might be the biggest mismatch on the field, but um, the Browns defense is not really good. I think when you look at their defensive metrics, they are kind of overrated right now because they played a very easy schedule of opposing offenses. And they also had these three crazy weather games against the Raiders, the Texans and the Eagles at home, where there was um, like 30 to 40 MPH of uh, wins. Um, and you, 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 could, you couldn't really um, pass the ball through the air. Uh, so their defensive metrics should usually be a little bit lower. And they will be without Denzel Ward and without Ronnie Harrison, which was, was a tremendous addition uh, this season. So they don't really have a secondary. Uh, the, their line-making core is very bad. 
their interior defensive line is bad. So the Titans can pretty much run the ball at will. And when they can, the, when the Titans can run the ball at will, they will also use a lot of play action off of that. Um, and when they get A.J. Brown, John o. Smith and uh, Corey Davis into space against this bad tackling Browns team, um, that really smells a disaster for me. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Titans once again score in the 30s. And I, and I really think that this drives this move. Um, but um, I think power numbers wise or any kind of model has trouble to get to this current market price of six. So I expect some buyback there. And I wouldn't be surprised if the number comes off the six and we see something like a, a minus five on Sunday. So is that enough for you to buy into the Browns here with the Titans now being six point favorites? Or do the matchup discrepancies that you discussed, do they drive you away from buying in, even, even though your numbers do see some value here? Um, I have a little bit of value on the spread, but because I don't like the matchup for the Browns, I'm just going to skip the side. I'm actually interested in the over um, here. Um, I think it was 54 before it came off the board. Um, I think it came off the board because of uh, some Brown staff member had COVID. Um, and I think on this game, we have a very fat tail on the right side of the distribution because with these two defenses and the way um, both offenses try to create big plays um, off of play action against the secondary. Um, I really think that could easily turn to a shootout. Um, Baker Mayfield, he is terrible under pressure, but the Titans can't really get any push up front. Clowney still out. I, sh I think Jeffrey Simmons is dealing with a knee injury. The Titans defense is not really good. So I'm actually expecting quite a good game from Baker Mayfield. The run game should be solid. So... I can really see this game going to a shootout. But if this game goes into a shootout, I would still give the edge to the Tennessee Titans because the passing game is still um, on another level than the one of the Browns. I absolutely agree with that. Um, awesome. Let's move on to Rams at Cardinals. Rams are a three-point favorite. Uh, markets have uh, decided since the early weeks of the season that they, they really like this team. Uh, total of 48 and a half. Um, neither of these teams played really well. In week 12, uh, I feel like Jared Goff is, is what I call a high-variance quarterback. How do you mm. see this game playing out? Um, yeah, I benefited from the early market move early in the week. Um, I played the Cardinals at plus three, I think minus 06. Um, I didn't really get to the three here. Um, I, I made this game a, a pick em. Um I have these teams very equal on a neutral field. Um, I think... Matchup-wise, the Cardinals could get into trouble because the Rams have a very good defense. They could put Jalen Ramsey on DeAndre Hopkins. Um, and that leaves the Cardinals with Christian Kirk and Larry Fitzgerald on some underneath stuff. Um, I think the, the early market move was also something indicating that the market is not f fully confident that Kyler Murray is going to be 100%. Um, there are some good fantasy doctors out there who think <laughs> that he's going to be close to 100%. Um, I think you saw it in the Patriots game. The Cardinals started really slowly. They were very conservative on, on offense. But um, in the second half, Kyler actually was running around. So I think he's two and a half weeks removed from his um, AC joint sprain or whatever that was. Um, I think he's going, he's going to be close to 100%. Um, and... Overall, when I look at these both teams, I think the Cardinals are at least equal to the Rams. If we look at some stuff like schedule-adjusted EPA per play, the, the Cardinals are almost one tier ahead of the Rams this season. Um, the Rams offense hasn't really been good, like Ed already said. Um, Jared Goff um, had a very good start to the season, first, first three or four weeks. Since then, the passing game has completely fell off a cliff. Um, I think on the season they are like 21st in EPA per dropback. Um, so I, I don't really buy this Rams offense with Jared Goff, with high variance Jared Goff and without his um, start left tackle Andrew Whitworth to, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kyler Murray um, and his set of weapons. Um, so like I said, I had a 
decent discrepancy between my own number and and the and the market number and plus three at home with the Cardinals. I couldn't really pass up, and I really gotta go with Kyler Murray here um, over Jared Goff. So does the faith in Kyler Murray being healthier this week give you any thoughts on the over here at 48 and a half? Or do the concerns around the Rams offense push you off of uh, pulling the trigger there? Um, gun to my head, I would probably lean towards the over. But I think it's a very fa fair market number right now. Um, uh, Jared Goff, the difference between the Cardinals' defense of recent years and, and this year is that Vance Joseph uh, suddenly decided that he's going to play a lot more man coverage and comes up with a lot more blitzes. So this is not really the same Cardinals defense that McVay torched um, over the last three seasons. So I think this um, blitz-heavy Cardinals defense can actually give Jared Goff some issues especially um, with that offensive line. We saw it three weeks ago or four against Brian Flowers and the Miami Dolphins. As soon as you come up with heavy blitzes and try to confuse him, I think um, he is very due for some mistakes. And um, yeah, I just think that I would rather take the Cardinals offense with Kyler Murray over Jared Goff. All right, so let's move here to uh, the Bills at the 49ers. Bills now one-point favorites here. They were two and a half. It's now one. Total is 48. And the 49ers, I think, justified me that movement. They showed a lot more life in Week 12 as they started to get some key contributors back. Richard Sherman is back. Debo Samuel is back. Do you think that that good performance was a one-week blip, or should we now be higher on the 49ers than we were in the middle of the year when all those injuries were really piling up? I think we should absolutely be higher on them um, because the defense has been really good over, over recent weeks, even with all those injuries. Um, I think Robert Sally, the defensive coordinator, is doing a tremendous job. Um, Jason Barrett has been a tremendous addition this year. He's really locking down some receivers on his side. Uh, now Richard Sherman is back, so that makes it really hard for quarterbacks to throw outside the numbers when there are Jason Barrett and uh, Richard Sherman covering two-thirds um, of their cover three zone defense. Um, they have a very good linebacking corp. Uh, their pass rush is actually not as bad as I um, assumed it would be without um, Nick Bosa and D Ford. They got some um, guys from the second row really stepping up. Um, and I think Josh Allen won't have a very easy game. John Brown is a downgrade for the offense that he's on IR because his deep speed really opens up some stuff underneath for Stefan Dix. So I think the Bills matchup-wise are going to have a rough time because their run game should be non-existent. The Niners defense is really good against the run and the Bills don't have a good run game on the season so far. So it will really come down to Josh Allen playing against the Niners defense. And I, and I wouldn't even be surprised if Brian Devil comes up with the same game plan as he came up against Seattle, where they uh, had a like a 100% pass <laughs> rate on early downs. Um, and then it really comes down to whether Josh Allen can... Um, by himself, outscore this Niners offense. Um, I have some concerns with Nick Mullins. I think within the scheme of Kyle Shannon, he's a very solid quarterback who gets the job done against an average defense. Um, they will try to run the ball as much as, as they can, try to get Brendan Ayuk, who is, who is going to be back into space, Debo Samuel into space. And the Bills defense hasn't really been good. So I think there are some areas where the Niners can attack this uh, Bills defense in space and um, on the ground. Um, overall, I think this this is going to be a 50-50 matchup. My, my own number for this game was three. And it's actually interesting that there are some um, um, different market opinions among some sharp guys and, and some sharp groups. There were some sharp groups who played um, the um, Niners at three and two and a half. But I also know some really sharp guys who like the Bills in this matchup. So it's going to be interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if that number bounces a little bit between one and three um, until Monday. Um, right now, I would tend to lean Buffalo uh, because I make this number three. And when, when I break everything down, I would still prefer the much better quarterback in this game. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going to wait and see where the number moves. So, Fabian, you had this Bills 
favored by three? Your number? Uh, close to three, yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, awesome. Are there any other games over at FanDuel Sportsbook uh, that stand out to you? Um, one game that stands out where we don't really know what the quarterback is going to be is the Dolphins against the uh, Bengals. I think the count market number when I saw that right is minus 11.5. Is, mm -hmm. is that right? Yep, um, that's correct. So... If Tua Tagovailoa is going to play, and I think Brian Flores said that he won't uh, declare a starter until Sunday morning, which is kind of weird, um, <laughs> I think that number would have to come down towards 10. But I personally don't think that um, Tua is going to play. Um, he had two limited practices. He's playing. Uh, he's practicing with a brace. I don't really think that Brian Flores is going to say, hey, Tua, after two... A limited practices i'm going to play you in a very important playoff uh, a game with playoff imp implications so i think that's ryan fitz uh, i think that ryan fitzpatrick is going to start and i th i don't really see how the Bengals are going to score touchdowns in this game um that dolphins defense is really really good against the pass um the Bengals have a bottom three offensive line uh, Brandon Brand Allen is just a backup quarterback. And um, Brian Flowers, his defense has been extremely good when we look at all the games against um, average at best quarterbacks. Um, against average quarterbacks this year, Cam Newton minus 0.1 EPA per play. Uh, Gardner Minshew minus 0.13. Uh, Joe Flacco minus um, 0.37. Jed Goff minus 0.4. And Donald last week. So um, usually defensive metrics are a reflection of the opposing offense that you play. So f for a ve very big part. Um, but there's also some signal in defensive performances. And this signal for the Dolphins, in my opinion, is, is kind of strong. Because when they play a um, average or below average passing offense, they completely shut them down. And that's what I what I'm expecting to see. Um, against the Bengals this week. And I think when Ryan Fitzpatrick gets um, called into the lineup, I wouldn't be surprised if that number skyrockets to like minus 13, minus 13 and a half. Um, power rating wise, I think that most ratings won't agree with such a number. Um, I think m many ratings will have the Dolphins like a minus 10, minus 11. But I think that because it's such a big difference, uh, sorry, a, a big matchup advantage for the Dolphins defense against Brandon Allen behind this offensive line. I think we have to adjust a little bit more here. Um, I, I made this number minus 13 and a half with Ryan Fitzpatrick. Um, I wanted to wait uh, for some practice reports um, whether Tua is looking to play. I don't think he's going to play um, and I would uh, probably lock that in rather sooner, sooner than later. Okay, so reading the tea leaves here and trying to see if Tua starts and then reacting to the Dolphins. Like you said, that Dolphins defense has been very good and it's benefited us here the past couple of weeks as well. That is Fabian Sommer. Fabian, thank you so much for swinging by today and breaking down week 13 for us. Really appreciate all the insights. Thank you again and good luck to you with your bets in week 13. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good day. Thank you as well. Appreciate it. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Fabian Somer for swinging by and breaking down week 13. Catch Fabian on Twitter at S-U-U-M-A-A-10 and check out his website, football-handicapping.com and his uh, videos he does with Matchbook and Drew Dinzig there as well. And Ed, uh, it was fun to hear the way that Fabian makes his numbers because I, I think that the manual aspect of it, and we always want to automate, but like, Manually doing things when we were this deep in the year and there are so many non-regular starters of quarterback, there's a lot of value in that. So I thought it was interesting to hear the way that he actually does that by hand. Yeah, absolutely. And like <clears throat> the final results are actually pretty close to to what I have. So, yeah. uh, you know, in my numbers, he said ten, it's going to be hard to make a number that's Tennessee minus six. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, mine's minus four. Um, he had Rams and Cardinals at pretty much a pick. I, I have I have Rams to win by two, but still on the same side. Uh, and then he had Buffalo by about three. I have it a little bit more at, than that. Uh, I'm using my market rankings here be, to, just to adjust for the quarterback situation. That's actually a pretty interesting game in general. Um, 
And so anyways, uh, agreement with what he was saying and, and what I'm putting out. Uh, you, have, you should also remember that like they're playing Buffalo at San Francisco in Arizona. I have yeah. that as a neutral site because it's a neutral site, especially this week for, for San Francisco because right. they're essentially traveling there. Um, so that's part of uh, uh, something you should think about. Uh, it's, uh, they're both traveling this week. It's, it's basically like a Super Bowl type game. Yeah, really weird situation too with the, with the 49ers having to play. I think it's their next two or three games in Arizona. So this one got lucky because it's on a Monday. Uh, but, you know, just a really interesting situation there for sure. And it's fun to hear that your numbers are similar because it sounds like there are very different routes to getting there. Uh, and it's nice when, when numbers align, but the, the, the method for getting there is different. I think that's always a fascinating situation. So thank you to Fabian for joining us and breaking that down. Let's move now into covering the future for week number 13. Ed, you want to talk Pittsburgh versus Washington. What are you seeing in that game? Yeah, so um, when, I was th- when I decided to talk about this game, uh, a lot of books had uh, Pittsburgh as a 10-ish point favorite. Um, that's not what you're going to find at FanDuel Sportsbook right now because <laughs> John Sheeran knows uh, what he's doing. Um, but I don't know if I've talked about Pittsburgh as the most overrated 11-0 team ever, but but they really are in, in my mind. And and the problems really are in the offense. Um, you know, the, the pure numbers-wise, they rank 23rd when I look at adjusted success rate. And you can just think about the game last night, right, where I think they had a final – how many points? They had like 19 points. Yeah, it was. But one of them rough. was a defensive touchdown, right? Yeah. A pick six early in the game. And there's been a lot of that this season. You know, they lead the NFL in takeaways. Um, so it's this interesting situation where they're like, you know, bottom 10 when you look at the the underlying metrics in terms of success rate. But they're sixth best when you look at points scored. Um, but a lot of that is turnovers, good field position. Um, and they're only 20th. Football Outsiders actually tracks yards per drive, and they're only 20th in that metric. Um, so, I mean, I feel like I'm going to be fading Pittsburgh a lot kind of heading into the future. Um, but their defense is good. Uh, you know, they're, they're the best defense when I look at adjusted success rate. And when you think about this unit, you know, it's a lot of the same guys that they had last year. And this unit was good enough to make the Steelers 8-8 eight and eight despite the awful QB play of Mason Rudolph and Delvin Hodges last year, right? So... Anyways, that, that should tell you something. Um, so Washington is another team that gets carried by its defense. It's third in my adjusted success rate. Uh, and, you know, another team that has been struggling on offense. Um, you know, I, I, I did look at the last four games since Alex Smith has took over. Um, his passing success rate has been decent uh, compared to what we had saw before. You know, 56% against the New York Giants, 51% against Detroit. 41% against Cincinnati, 50% against Dallas. The NFL average is about 46%. So, you know, reasonable numbers. And, of course, like, those four pass defenses all stink. So, you know, it's not like it's not like he's facing anything like they're seeing in Pittsburgh. But, um, it, look, Alex Smith in that offense is going to struggle against Pittsburgh defense, right? So, um, but they might be better off than, than throwing, uh, who I think Dwayne Haskins is healthy, right? So, yeah, he's been healthy all year. He just hasn't, you know, they just decided to bench him and like, yeah. not even bench. They like, he got relegated. If we're going to like go back to Fabian and the soccer discussion, Dwayne Haskins got relegated effectively. <laughs> but Ron Rivera still believes in him. I think. Right. I <laughs> so my number makes this, uh, Pittsburgh to win by about eight, 7.7 7 points. Um, if you can find a nine out there, I would, I would definitely take Washington on, on this spot right here, especially Pittsburgh on a short rest. Uh, a lot of their key guys, nursing injuries. Um, but I'm also intrigued by the under, um, silly FanDuel Sportsbook has this at a pretty low number. I think what you're saying, 42. Yeah, it's 42 right now. Yeah. They, they know you, they knew what you were going to do, Ed. Like I know. Maybe John Sheeran is a subscriber to your email newsletter. Maybe you should, uh, check, check that. <laughs> No, John, John's great. And like, I mean, I think that's pretty close to where this number should be. Um, my model says 41.7. So I, I don't really use my totals model too much. I, um, but it uses uh, yards per pass attempt in coming up with that total. Um, but I'm going to rework it so that it's using success rate in the future. But if I did that now, I'm pretty sure the number would come out lower than uh than even 41.7 i don't know how much lower because i haven't run it yet but uh definitely you know i definitely see pittsburgh as an as an under team 
with what, you know, as soon as they stop getting these defensive touchdowns and, and turnovers that are putting him in, in prime field goal position, uh, fi- prime field position. Um, so, you know, if you can find a 43, 44 out there, which I think I saw right before we got on the show, uh, I would yeah. definitely take that. Well, I think the two thing too with, um, with Pittsburgh is that you would think that because they're such a heavy passing team, they would be an over team, but they, it doesn't matter because it's so, they're all so short. Like, Mina Kahn's of ESPN brought up the like this thing that Ben Roethlisberger's being like a point guard. Uh, this was like in week five, and people just railed against her because they're like, "Oh no, Ben! You know Ben, he chucks it deep." But like with every week that's gone past, it's like, "Oh, Mina becomes more and more right with what she said," and yet people are just stupid on Twitter. They haven't like admitted that yet. But like right. this has been a thing all year, and Ben's been this dink and dunk type guy, which is very un Ben Roethlisberger like. So even though. They are a heavy passing team. It's hard to expect a lot of points in their games because it's just so short. And, like, sure. it's it's a boring passing offense. I think I'm okay saying it. Like, you said the most overrated 11-0 team. I'll say the mo- they're the most boring 11-0 team just because, like, I don't know. I don't I don't like watching their brand of football that, all that much. So right. I, I mean, think under makes sense here, too. Yeah, I mean, he does have some young receivers. Yeah. Um, I mean, they seem to me like they have a lot of talent, so I don't know why they're not chucking it a little deeper. They should chuck uh, it to their good receiver. They should chuck it to Chase Claypool and uh, just do that instead. I think that'd be great. But no. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess he did throw one last night to Deontay Johnson that he just dropped. So. Yeah. Deontay's infuriating for fantasy, so it's uh, <laughs> that's – you're speaking my language here, that is for sure. Okay, so Ed uh, wants you to look for the best number you can get on potentially getting Washington, potentially getting the under on that game. For mine, this is terrifying, Ed, but I want to put money on the Los Angeles Chargers. Now, before you jump <laughs> off the screen, I want to say I'm not betting the money line. I'm not betting the spread. I am betting their team total over 24 points at FanDuel Sportsbook. Over is minus 104 right now. I will take the over on that. And the big reasoning here is the Patriots' defense, they're absolutely not what they once were. Once you adjust for schedule, they rank 19th overall defensively according to number fires metrics, and that's even while benefiting from forced turnovers. If you look at like a success rate model, I'd be interested in what your numbers say about them. They're likely even worse than that. So 19th if you don't over-account for turnovers, uh, but I'm sure a success rate model would be lower on them than that. And it's just been hard to notice because – They faced a lot of bad teams. When they faced a top 10 passing offense, they have let up 28 points per game so far this year. Chargers rank ninth in schedule adjusted passing offense based on number fires metrics. They've gone over 24 points in six out of 10 games that Justin Herbert has started so far this year. Two of the times they fell short were in uh, road games on the East Coast. This one is in Los Angeles. Basically, I just don't think the Chargers defense or the Patriots defense is very good. And I think the Chargers offense is. So, I'm okay considering the Chargers money line here, but that's actually the same juice as you get on this number. It's minus 104 on the money line. The juice on over 24 points is minus 104. This gives me an out in case they score points, but then do the usual dumb Chargers stuff at the end of the game with their in-game management. So I want that out. I want that wiggle room. So I will go over 24 points on the Chargers for week 13. I am not dealing with the shenanigans of the Chargers coaching staff. But, Ed, like I said, I think that the Patriots' defense probably grades out worse if you look at a success rate model. What do your numbers say about them? That is true. They're 31st. They're the second-worst defense when uh, you take a success rate and adjust for who you play. They're bad. In my model, in my methods. I think that uh, even if you look at, like, daily fantasy stuff, like, sites are still – Bumping down salaries for, for players facing New England? Cool. I'll take the discount. Like, I think that's where we're at right now. It's it's pretty evident by this point that the opt-outs hurt New England a lot. And if you can still take advantage of that, whether it be in the betting space or in DFS, you should do exactly that. So Chargers over 24 points, and hopefully uh, the coaching staff does not get in the way of that late in the game that is all the time that we have for today and this week here on covering the spread big thank you once again to pamela maldonado yesterday and fabian somer today for breaking down college football and the nfl to get pamela's uh episode go to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast make sure you are subscribed to get it as we go live each and every week and also leave a rating and review if you like what you hear ed what is going on for you this week over at the power rank yeah so the power rank has a youtube channel 
Yeah, nice. So Drew like Martin it. has been doing videos uh, every week. He breaks down college football games. Uh, he gives you what my model says. Uh, and in addition to his own handicapping analysis. So yeah, I have a YouTube channel now. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, you can use the URL, thepowerrank.us uh, to check out the Power Rank YouTube channel. Uh, who knows what else I'll end up doing over there. But um, but yeah, that's uh, that's what's going on. The Power Rank that US for the YouTube channel. Okay, perfect. So go there, check out. And Drew Martin's a super sharp guy. So if we can combine the Power yeah. Rank and Drew Martin, I think that's always oh. something people should want to take advantage of. Yeah, I should also mention I had Drew on my uh, my podcast uh, okay. this week. So that was the second podcast I recorded this week with the uh, the, the Liberty at Coastal Carolina game that is <laughs> is not being played. But it's still useful because I did ask him to break down BYU. Okay, uh, broke down Cincinnati as well. Talked about whether Auburn is uh, in blue blood purgatory. Uh, <laughs> that was actually a pretty fun discussion on, on both ends. Um, unfortunately, Drew talking I Auburn probably... is always fun. What? Drew talking Auburn is always fun. Yeah, absolutely. And he, he had a very uh, mature attitude about it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was a fun conversation. Uh, I, w- I was listening I was listening back to it today yeah. before we got on the show. I was like, yeah, I really talked a lot in this one. But... <laughs> Usually let the guests talk a little bit more, but you know. That's me every weekend. So like, I, I know where you're coming from. Uh, but the PowerRank.us to get uh, the YouTube channel and the Football Analytics Show to hear the conversation with Drew there. Make sure you follow Ed on Twitter at the PowerRank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast, our daily fantasy podcast. Went up earlier today with myself and Brandon Gadula breaking down the Week 13 main slate. Good running backs, bad everything else. So it should be a fun one for sure. Find that by searching for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck with your bets across Week 14 in college football and Week 13 in the NFL. Back again next week for more here on Covering the Spread. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. (laughs) 